<laughs> uh, today though, uh, when you introduce our guest, you would have to describe him as uh, the chairman of SAC Force Holdings Limited and the founder of the National Interest Movement, Dr. Abu Sakara Foster is our guest this morning. It's such a pleasure to have you once again. Thank you. Mm. I suppose we should start from this point. Yes. You know, um, what, what are your thoughts on what the, the uh, government is doing about this? Well, of course, uh, some action needs to be taken. Uh, but the real issue is uh, how effective is that action going to be? Uh, because, you see, water always flows downhill. It mm. finds its way. And what we're talking about is really purchasing price of soya bean. Uh, if it was profitable for the farmers, the prices that are being offered locally, compared to the ones that the foreign people coming to buy them are offering them, mm. why would they sell them to them? And when you look at the yields of soya bean, which are relatively quite low, I mean, the estimated amount is three tons per hectare. But you talk to most people who grow soya beans and they don't get much more than one ton mm. per hectare out of it. And you consider all the costs involved. Uh, so at the end of the day, what we should really be tackling is how can we produce soya bean more profitably? If the yields are that compressed, by now, we should be talking of a hybrid that can get us a 3.54 tons per hectare, mm. especially when we're importing so much high soybean, which is costing so much more than the one that we have. Indeed. You know? And then, after producing it in the northern belt, you have to transport it down to the southern belt. So, you look at the computation of the cost structure and say, how can I intervene in such a way that the price at the market will be competitive and it will stay here. Those are the things that policy should do. At the same time, you look at the prices that you're importing the soya bean for and say, what interventions can we take to make our people more competitive? Mm -hmm. Those are the interventions that when you take those measures, you don't have to chase anybody. <laughs> They'll bring themselves. Okay. <laughs> you know? and, and but if you go to the issue of corralling people, it, you know, there was a limit to how effective that can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And talking about interventions, yeah. what are some of the interventions that we can look at, particularly in this case? We've had, we're setting up an interministerial six, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, committee. We want to ensure that people do not smuggle these to other countries. But mm -hmm. what are those interventions that we can make to ensure that they would bring themselves, as you put it? Yeah. You see, all those interventions come down to competitiveness of the price in the marketplace. And they begin from the potential of your variety, which, as I said, even though it is touted as three tons per hectare, you ask most soybeans growers, and they don't get much more than one ton per hectare out of it, if they're lucky. So we have to look for a variety that justifies opening up that land whether it's producing one ton per hectare or three tons per hectare, the cost of opening up the land is the same. The cost of weeding is the same. So immediately you see that if you're below a certain level and you cannot push past a certain level, then you are going to have to charge a lot more for that soya bean to be competitive in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So now we have to introduce some new varieties, hybrid varieties, that will produce at least 3.5 tons easily. In the, then we have to look at our own cost of production. One of the big areas is threshing and harvesting of the soy, uh, soya bean. Mm. We have not mechanized it. It's still very labor intensive. And that's why a lot of the farmers, you know, tend to get away from it. So if you don't have these people with these high prices coming into the marketplace, they wouldn't even grow it in the first place, which is why you have a deficit, which is why you're importing uh, soya bean. Mm -hmm. you, you get me? So at the end of the day, we have to sit down and solve the real problem. The real problem is that we're not very competitive in production of soya bean because our yields are too low mm -hmm. and the cost in labor it's very expensive to handle it. So if we can introduce machinery 
uh, small scale machinery that eases the uh, demand for labor at harvesting mm. and also threshing. Are you with me? And then, if we want to really incentivize people, incentives are always more effective than punishments. Mm. <laughs> are you with me? If you really want to incentivize people, let's look at the energy in production. Because at the end of the day, energy is a key factor. And we subsidize everything, and we're willing to subsidize everything. But the one thing that has a pervasive impact from production up to transportation, up to processing, which is the cost of energy, yeah, we keep well away from it. Okay, we'll give you a few, uh, subsidize a few bags of fertilizer there. But the main elephant in the room mm. is ignored. And that is really where those countries who have a competitive advantage look at the cost of energy in agriculture, in the productive sector, and they subsidize it. After all, you and I know mm. that the tax on diesel is up to 60%. Mm. So why do you want to tax somebody who is going to produce something that will reduce your foreign exchange? Cut it by half. Mm. Let's say, let's give him a rebate of 30%. Mm. Are you with me? That immediately makes it more competitive bearing in mind he's already starting at a, a lower level. So these are the things that we need to sit down with pencil and paper and start from the market and you work the cost structure backwards and say, okay, so where can I intervene to help my uh, people be competitive? So that's the bottom line. Uh, and after that, of course, your other you know, trade policies are important. If you have soya bean which has already been pressed in Brazil to take the first oil out and then maybe sometimes the second one. And what we are getting here is just the dry bones of the soya bean. And then we are using that locally. Mm. And you want to compare the price of that. Sometimes it's even more expensive than the whole grain soya bean, which is here. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's mm. shocking. Yeah. <laughs> you mm. know, so I, I think there's some things that are just not right. And it all comes down to price. And as I said, it will always find a way of balancing its way out, mm -hmm. no matter how much you know you corral it. Yeah. Now you, you you talked about even though we say we produce you know um, uh, three metric tons per hectare, mm. if you look at the figures, that's mm. a bit of I mean it's just about one. And I'm just looking at the mm -hmm. uh, you know facts and figures from the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. instance. And so in 2000 and 19, mm. we cultivated some 112,000 hectares. Mm -hmm. And out of that, we got some 193,000 metric tons. Mm -hmm. In 2020, we cultivated 116,000 mm -hmm. and we got 209,000 metric tons. Mm -hmm. So you can see that in 2019, mm -hmm. it's 1.7. Mm -hmm. So just around the one you're talking mm -hmm. about. But it improves to 1.8 mm -hmm. in 2020. 20. Mm -hmm. And 2018, still 1.7. Mm -hmm. uh, does the 0.1 percentage increase suggest maybe we're beginning to change the well, way we do things? No, but I, I think you see, first of all, uh, the way you calculate and capture your total amount produced and your total acreage may be very different. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, it may not be that accurate to start off with. So, at the end of the day, how do you estimate? total amount of area cultivated to soya bean. You ask people. Yeah. <laughs> Are you with me? You don't actually go and measure it. <laughs> uh, your field officers and extension officers, oh, I have so many farmers and they have so much. I have so many farmers and they have so much. Are you with me? Mm. Some of those figures, as we know, are not updated in a very accurate way. Because first of all, the guy is not very mobile. So how has he gone to measure all those things? So we have to take some of these figures, uh, you know, the one, the one that you can get, which you know about, is the total amount that is exported because it goes through the port and you can measure it. The ones which are in the marketplace, again, they're estimated. But be that as it may, are you with me? Something which is supposed to produce 3.5 tons is given us 1.7 tons. And that is an average. An average also means that somebody could have got 0 0.5. Somebody could have got 2 point something. Yeah. Are you mm -hmm. with me? So the long and short of it is that even at 1.5 tons per hectare, 
it's not competitive. Yeah, because the costs involved outweigh the returns to investment. And that is why there's a tendency to want to sell it to the highest bidder. Because you know that you've already incurred some losses. So you must recuperate some of those losses back. Mm -hmm. So now, if you have a situation like that, the next issue is open up, solve the problem. And we solve the problem in one of two areas. Either we're going to allow them to get a higher market price, as high as the market can supply, or we look for how we can help them increase their yields by bringing in some hybrids that can go a bit higher than that, more reliably. Okay. And also look at how we cut down the cost of production, especially on f fuel and labor, right. by me mechanizing it. So, I mean, it's not rocket science. <laughs> Sure. Those people who have done it competitively, yeah. that they can afford to bring you what they have already squeezed the oil out of mm -hmm. and still make profit, are doing it. You know? Okay. So, um, if you just joined us, our guest is Dr. Abu Sakara Foster. Um, he, he sounds a warning that uh, if we don't uh, make some very immediate interventions, we might be facing a situation of food insecurity. Uh, we're going to be talking broadly about that. He's first uh, responded to the issue of soybean, uh, which was raised in the Joy News documentary. He says competitive pricing is what will solve that problem. He suggests interventions like increasing yield with new varieties, standardizing the cost of production by introducing machinery, uh, for harvesting and threshing, for incentivizing people with uh, the cost of energy in production, the cost of fuel uh, as well. Uh, and then he says, look, use the, use the carrot, not the stick. If you corral people, it creates a certain arbitrage which will uh, then uh, cause um, the, the smuggling and so forth to, to be even more attractive to them. All right, now uh, we're going we're gonna to... Just to, to, to finish off that point, Initially, we were having a lot of problems getting people to grow soybean. Mm -hmm. It was not until the export of soybean started that you had this increase in planted area. Mm -hmm. And then people saw that that was a place to make money. Right. So if the incentive is there, the people will move there. Mm -hmm. If you take away that incentive, they'll drop out of it, telling them that they cannot export the soya bean does not mean that next year he's going to produce it mm -hmm. if i cannot get this price for it then let me go and grow this other thing Indeed. or maybe i won't grow it at all mm -hmm. exactly because um, just to add this they make the point mm -hmm. that uh, you know for these persons who buy in a sponsor mm -hmm. they buy it at twice the price mm -hmm. that Ghanaian you know buyers would normally mm -hmm. pay absolutely and so for them they're workers they mm -hmm. farmed and they need more money mm -hmm. yeah if you bring the money they sell to you. After all, they don't know whether this is a Ghanaian or a non-Ghanaian. Mm. Well, they don't care whether it's a Ghanaian yeah. or a non-Ghanaian. Not to mention that this is non-GMO soybean. Mm. So there's an increasing market in the global trade mm. for soybean that is non-GMO because they feed it to beef that is advertised as non-GMO beef. Right. And that is very expensive. expensive. That is why they can afford to pay more for it. Mm -hmm. Of course, I do have in some area a reservation because what it means is that if the ministry is subsidizing mm. uh, production of soybean by, say, subsidizing cost of seed to farmers mm. and it ends up being exported, and the person making the money is the exporter. Right. Effectively, the ministry is exporting money mm -hmm. uh, because money that uh, would have stayed here is exported out mm -hmm. because there's a $50 premium on uh, uh, non-GMO soybean, mm -hmm. which is what we have here. But as I said, the solution then is to rearrange the uh, uh, framework so that you have much more production of it. People make much more money from it, are you with me? Mm -hmm. And there's enough for both your domestic needs and your, your, your foreign needs. Mm. Reducing and corralling is going to reduce the amount produ produced and there will be less and less of it, which will mean you have to import more and more of it. Mm. All right. So, as I explained at the beginning, this conversation became important because of... Uh, Let's call it a, a warning that uh, Dr. Abu Sakara Foster voiced um, to us. 
it's about the risk of food insecurity. Today, the average Ghanaian wakes up in the morning, feels like eating wache, and can send someone to go buy them wache, walk down the street, buy wache. What you're saying is that there may come a time when it's not what you fancy that you can buy, but whatever is left, whatever is available. Mm -hmm. Explain to us why this conversation is important now. What in particular is happening now that makes this conversation important? Okay. I think the first point is that more than three years ago, as when we first started dealing with this corona about two years, three years ago, I started signaling the alarm that, guys, we're going to be faced with the problem. We have to increase our own internal capacities to bridge that gap between what is our total food imports mm. and what we produce. In other words, we're not, it's not the case that we don't produce any food at all. Sometimes we even export some food, but we're a net food importer. In other words, the balance of what you export versus what you import uh, is not in your favor you are bringing in food from somewhere else. Mm. Now, that immediately sets a stage where you're dependent on a supply chain outside your country. And with the advent of corona, you didn't need to be a genius <laughs> to see that there was going to be serious disruption mm. in the global supply chains. So I took it really as, wow, this is the opportunity we've been waiting for. Let's capitalize on this, use it to drum up you know, the uh, enthusiasm to develop our own internal capacity, which mm -hmm. is what we've always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I started sounding the alarm that, hey, these global supply chains are going to be disrupted. Uh, you could see uh, the workers were not turning up in America because they closed the borders. Mm -hmm. uh, the Euro Europe was sending away some, uh, you know, Eastern Europeans. Uh, the, the ones that normally come for harvesting were not coming. Truck drivers were going etc etc essentially the supply chain was breaking down and it was not something that was hidden it was happening in full public view mm. so obviously the deduction <laughs> is mm. that you have to have some preemptive thinking if this is what is happening what is going to be the effect on me yeah so immediately we said look this is our chance let us increase our own internal capacities let us reorganize everything so that when we start from the price here, we can be competitive, mm. you know? So, also, let us bring into cultivation land that lies idle for six months of the year and labor that is idle for six months of the year, which is a cornerstone of our food security if we actually address it. Mm. I've just been looking at the figures for irrigated area but we'll come to that later on mm. and then you know why burkina brings you tom tomatoes mm. <laughs> you know mm. uh, but at the end of the day we started sounding these alarm bells of course at the time they're saying oh there's plenty of food you know there's these are alarmists etc you know what finally happened yeah now we're banning food exports and what have you mm. okay so it has caught up with us but then, of course, came the situation where even the small interventions that we were able to make, fertilizer subsidy and what have you, now the availability of supply fertilizer is a problem. And you can't do that as much as you, you could do before, not only because of the physical availability of it, but also the price has gone up significantly. Mm. Now, if the price has gone up significantly, already we're down. <laughs> and the competitiveness on price. Mm. Now you are tripling, you know, the cost of some imports. So that is only going to push us down further. Y you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. In the marketplace. So now we have to step back from all of this and say, look, uh, we've tried this path for now. Uh, it was not a bad idea that we should try to increase our productivity per unit area. All agriculture that develops needs to do that. But we also need to increase our cultivated area to secure, mm. <laughs> are you with me, yeah. a certain basic amount of production and also bring into cultivation a certain amount of land that is lying idle for a significant portion of the year. Now, when you look at our irrigated area, now we are estimated to have around 33,000 hectares 
of that 33,000 hectares, one would ask how much is actually operational. You know, if you go to just wager over here, you look at the original size of wager irrigation scheme and look at the size that is actually being used now. Some of the, most of the uh, channels are blocked up. Mm -hmm. And that is a story of many of our irrigation schemes, you know. Of course, there have been some rehabilitation, but you are rehabilitating a te technology, <laughs> are you with me, mm -hmm. that has already been superseded by new technology. So we should actually be thinking of things like drip irrigation and drip and things like that uh, as we are modifying these uh, irrigated areas rather than just, you know, redoing them again in the old technology. But that's another argument for another day. Right. The main issue here is what is the proportion of our irrigated la land? We know that in the south we have two rainy seasons. So for most of the year people can be active. We know from Bronga half of going up northwards, we have really only one effective rainy season. Mm. So more than half the country is used only for half the time. In fact, yeah. that's even an overestimation because it's only about three, three, four months that it's being used actively. So what, how can we bring under production a greater percentage of this land? When you consider we have four rivers, we have Black Volta, on the border with Ivory Coast, meandering back down through BP. We have the White Volta, comes through uh, the border with Burkina, meanders around through Yape to join the river uh, near uh, past BP. Mm -hmm. We have the Dhaka through uh, the Salaga area between Salaga and Bimbila, mm -hmm. comes through, joins the Black Volta. Then you have Oti, which is on the border with uh, you know, uh, uh, Togo, meanders around, comes and joins. Now, if God didn't ask you and you wanted to distribute your rivers over your land, could you get it better than this? <laughs> Are you with me? Yeah. So yeah. all the land in between, you don't have to do much to irrigate it. But you have to invest in doing that. And you have to make it a deliberate <coughs> policy mm. that I have X amount of irrigated area now as a percentage of my total cultivated area. And I'm going to increase it to this amount. In Burkina Faso, over the last four or five years, they've increased their irrigated area by 4,000 hectares. There are now almost 60,000 hectares of irrigated land. Are you with me? That is why they can send you tomatoes. Hmm. <laughs> yeah? Mm. Because in the season that you are sitting down doing nothing, they are producing. I mean, I, I'll, I'll come to the irrigated land, because I know you are also into farming, mm -hmm. I guess, uh, and I need to ask you that question. But when you say, I mean, we had to increase our total capacity in production and all of that, mm. today, what is the situation on the ground, practically, that convinces you that we're getting to a situation where if care is not taken, mm -hmm. we will not be food secured. Well, I think the first thing is this. This season, it looks like we're having a relatively good season. We're yet to see how it plays out. Yeah. But there is a cycle, and a known cycle. You take the data, you look at it. This season, next season, the season after that will be good seasons. The fourth one, trouble. Then the fifth one, catastrophe. Hmm. Then the sixth year, it may come back. So it goes in those cycles, and the pattern is clear. And in fact, if you just wind the clock back last year and the year before last, you saw that the rains were not good. Yeah. So now it's coming, it's going to be good again, and that's the pattern that goes around. What is happening is that the pattern of good seasons is getting shorter, so you'll be, you'll be having three instead of four, reliably. You know, so we cannot continue to rely on this rain-fed agriculture. On top of that, you look at the total production that we have, and you realize that with our increase in population, the total calorific intake, even though we claim to have achieved the first millennium goal, which is the total number of calories per person, it is an average. For those people who spend more than 60% of their income on food, and you know that prices have more than doubled, 
is he has he got 120 percent now to spend <laughs> are you with me mm. so it means that he's either reducing the quantity of food he's eating you know and the quality of food that they're eating and you may not be affected but there are thousands of people who are affected when they show you the bus to the size of the ball of the kinky mm. and it's the way it has reduced it seems like a joke but for him that is real space in his stomach <laughs> you know uh, so those things are happening it's not that we have to imagine them they are already happening in the society on top of that we just don't have that buffer we built up the buffer stock yeah. uh, over the three good years that i talked about and we're proud of it we're boasting of it where is it now hmm. <laughs> are you with me why have we started scrambling to ban exports if it is still there <laughs> are you with me the other issue which i feel and this is a very strong point is that we have to get politics out of agriculture it is not enough to want to look good all the time when the reality is different also it is not enough are you with me to do the bare minimum and agriculture must be supported more and it must demand more because if we are able to use that to underpin the economy life for so many people will be a lot better and it will make even our other problems easier to resolve mm -hmm. so it is clear now that the deficit globally <laughs> are you with me nobody is going to be rushing with food to come and supply you because mm -hmm. they don't have it yeah okay uh, if you look at wheat which is what we normally import uh, for because of bread etc a significant percentage of the feed wheat that is imported into Africa most of it goes to the northern uh, North Africa and the Horn of Africa that's where most of the the grain goes they are now in desperate straits <laughs> are you with me mm. and they will definitely be able to pay more for it than us so they will be the first to get it when it starts flowing again but the other side of the equation is that it is not the source of the highest calorie for our, our intake. Our source of calorie intake is on yams, root crops, you know, banana crops, and then we top up with some rice, you know, before we talk about the bread. Not mm -hmm. everybody eats bread in Ghana. If you're eating bread in Ghana, you're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> are you with me <laughs> so at the end of the day the question then is why is it that those things that provide the shock absorber to our food security we have not placed more emphasis on them and are placing emphasis on those things that are actually the source of the turbulence mm. <laughs> are you with me uh, so the root tube when we had this food crisis uh, i think in the 80s something yeah. like that, you these people predicted mayhem etc etc but we were fairly well buffered why because it was the price of wheat and maize that was the problem and for most of our calorie intake we're getting it from the root tubers and the bananas etc so it affected us but not that significantly the question is what have we been doing on the root and tuber front, on the banana uh, plantain front, etc., to further increase the capacity of the shock absorber in lieu of what is happening now globally. You know? Okay. Yeah. Now, you've talked about irrigation. Mm. I know you're into farming. Mm. Uh, years ago, when we spoke, you talked about how you are into rice cultivation mm -hmm. in the north. And you are into irrigation too, yes, isn't it? Yes, I have some irrigation. So at least you, you, you started. Well, we invested in it, but again, you know, uh, cost of diesel. <laughs> are you mm -hmm. very expensive? Mm -hmm. uh, now, to be honest with you, if there was air cargo out of Tamale, and we could produce high-value crops like vegetables, send it to uh, the airport in Tamale because we're only one hour away from mm. there, and it's exported. Even with the cost of diesel, we would make money, especially in the winter period when there's no 
uh, vegetables uh, or there's a shortage of vegetable supply, vegetable and fruit supply in the European market. But to bring all that produce down by road to Accra, that is the problem mm. because it's perishable. The second part of it is that you are now increasing the most expensive component, which is transportation by road, You're adding diesel costs. Mm -hmm. Now, the solution to this is to look for renewable energies. Mm -hmm. If we can get solar-powered uh, irrigation facilities, and that's the trajectory that we must go, we mustn't just go for irrigation. So, so, so in, in effect, in your case, yeah. are you still engaged in the irrigation or because of the cost of fuel, mm -hmm. you have stopped or having a second thought about continuing? No, definitely we, we, uh, we are looking for a very high value crop, are you with me? That, and I won't disclose that to you at the moment because we are in competition. Uh, we are looking for a very high value crop and we, we are actually quite almost there to getting that, but we must process it right there on the spot okay. to be able to make ends meet. So again, you are looking at exporting? Uh, that one, there will be internal consumption as well as exports because we we import a lot of that stuff here as well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, if you just joined us, this is the Super Morning Show. Our guest, Dr. Abu Sakara Foster, uh, sounding a warning that if we don't physically change uh, the way we approach agriculture, we might be uh, finding ourselves in a uh, a food crisis. The supply chains are breaking down across the world and we ought to be seeing that as an opportunity to become self-sufficient here in Ghana. There's so much more for us to explore, mm -hmm. including some of the strategies, the ways forward. How do we mechanize agriculture in a nation that has been using hoes and cutlasses for centuries? Uh, we'll be exploring that and more when we come back yes. from these messages. On Friday, 24 June 2022, Raven Consulting GA presents Africa Family Business Summit 2022 with a theme, Building Resilience in Family Businesses for Continuity. Speakers for this year's summit include Mr. James Mwagi, Sir Sam Esunjuna, Dr. Russell Thakre, Mrs. Siri Agbe, Mr. Theodore Albright, Mrs. Kate Kote Papathew, Dr. Moses Sakwa, Ms. Franca Maria Andal, and your convener, Mr. Dennis Oteng. Remember, the event is on Friday, 24 June 2022 time afternoon session 1 p.m. an executive workshop with Dr. Russell Tucker evening session 6 p.m. networking dinner and AFB conference the venue is the Kempiski Hotel Gold Coast City Accra for details of participation and corporate packages please contact 0509 732 535 Partners ACC La Bianca Company Limited Kempiski Hotel Apex Human Console Order Events Media Partners Joy 99.7 FM Joy Business Business and Financial Times. This event is powered by Raven Consulting GH. Driver, so is you no mommy why? Your money no rich. But you're also sweating. Sick of the 11 no. 11 I a ding. Aha, see them. Government speaking. By their words, you shall know them. Ah, wait, oh. Are you aware that if we had better road network, we would not be in this unnecessary traffic? I'm aware, pa. But things are tough. Indeed, things are tough all over. That is why we need to come together and ensure a better future for Ghana. Pa, what are you talking about? Bosu, when we all pay it, it becomes more. Little drops of e-levy can build a mighty nation. We are sure. When you pay your taxes, including e-levy, the government will be in a better position to provide more social amenities and build more infrastructure. Hmm. Charlie, he not be easy. Mitewase, but it gets better when we have a plan and we stick to it. Many Ghanaians don't pay their taxes. It's not easy for the government to. E-Levy knew a good plan, so let's together build our nation with it. Hey, E-Levy Ambassador Papa pa. <laughs> Let your taxes work for you and let's help develop Ghana together. This ad is powered by the government of Ghana, Ghana Revenue Authority and the people of Ghana. Pay your taxes. Arthur Legacy Sports and the Italian Embassy present the Cultural Trade Ball All-Stars Game at the Accra Sports Stadium on Friday, June 17, from 5 p.m. A spectacular evening of football, music, the All-Stars Game will parade top international stars like Andre Ayew, Felix Safenajan, and many more. Get your e-tickets by dialing star 713 star 33 star 00 hash or send hash 00 hash to 0242 42 
6427. And follow the prompt to buy your tickets and be a part of this football fiesta. Friday, 17th June from 5 p.m. at the Christ Sports Stadium. Be there or be squared. My first thing was sneaking into the fridge to sip on some ideal milk. My first <laughs> telephone was two empty tins of ideal milk connected by a long string. My first taste of freedom was when I had one full tin of ideal to myself in My the fridge. My <laughs> Make more beautiful memories with ideal milk as we celebrate our 50th anniversary. You can win a brand new car and other exciting prizes when you text the special code behind each ideal original anniversary label. The more you buy and text, the better your chances. This Advert is FDA approved. Mark your calendars for 9 a.m. on the 4th of June. Nagar is holding a free seminar in Accra, Ghana. But that's not all. We're sending our very own Director of Education, Mr. Andreas Dalasinos, to host the seminar for you. Want a chance to learn from one of the world's leading industry experts? Mr. Dalasinos will show you how to boost your trading knowledge. The seminar will be held at the Accra Marriott Hotel located at Liberation Road, Airport City, Accra, Ghana. Excited? We didn't even tell you the best part yet there is going to be a draw and the 10 lucky winners of this draw will walk away with $100 each but beyond the prize everyone will walk away with knowledge during this seminar you will learn who Naga is what makes them a leading broker and how you can take advantage of their tools and resources to begin your trading career to reserve your seat simply text yes to 055-199-1234 one more time that's 055-199-1234 for Naga, the official sponsor of Sevilla FC. What would you do if you have the chance to do anything in life? Build your dream house, take very good care of your family and plan for a comfortable retirement. Plan a befitting funeral for your loved ones. When they depart, how would you live? If you knew there was a friend waiting to support you, on all of your life's choices. You have such a friend in Glyco Life Insurance. Glyco Life has all the plans to meet your life's needs. Your child's education, your life savings, your mortgage, funerals, redundancy, and your retirement, and takes the burden off your shoulders. So go ahead and live life to the fullest today with Glyco Life Insurance plans. And remember that all our policies are hedged against inflation. Talk to Glyco Life on 0302 218 500 or 246142. Also visit our website at www.glycolife.com or any of our branches nationwide for more information. Glycolife, we cushion you for life. Glyco, we cushion you for Charlie, so it's actually raining and we can't hear any sound. As for this, your house, when it's raining, no sound. When the sun is up, the interior is cool. What roof are you using? Uh, they use Ico Roofing Shingles from Interface Limited. Long lasting and beautiful. Ico Roofing Shingles. We all for move to Interface and get this Ico Roofing Shingles. Interface Limited is the leading supplier and installer of finishing input materials for the building and construction industry in Ghana. Call us on 0274-999999 or visit our website at www.interfacelimited.net. Facebook, Interface Limited GH. Instagram, Interface.Limited. From now till August 2022, Latina Travel and Tours is giving you the opportunity to make this summer the most memorable time for you and your family. Walk into any UMB branch or call Latina Travel and Tours to find out how you two can present your family with an unforgettable experience at Disneyland Paris. It's open to everyone looking to have an amazing experience this summer. It's $3,600 for adults and $2,990. 90 for children, 8% off early bird discount available. It includes flight, 8 days stay in Paris, a boat trip on the Seine River, visit to the Eiffel Tower, Champs Elysees, the monuments, and many more. Visit the nearest UMB branch or call Etina Travel and Tours on 050 565 7821 or ask Sika, the UMB virtual assistant, WhatsApp at 0266 020 400 or at www.myumb.com bank for more information today. Everybody fa 
Malonat sa malaria. Petri dinti lunonat na ogonto. Malaria chew. Ani. Oho popo. Ani. Put me in the D. Ani. I want you. Ani. Lunonat. Lunonat. Eda ba kubo. Lunonat. Eda mi enu. Lunonat. Lunonat. Eda mi ensa. Lunonat. Malaria. No no no. Lunonat skata skata malaria. Lonat e de scatter malaria. A quality product from Blaze GVS Pharma. Yen shishemu who se malaria wa wumujem and sana wanum luna. Na nami en search na malaria no dasu wa wa kohu dokuta. This advert is FDA approved. Coffee in your cup. Enjoy on the set. The super morning show is always the best bet on joy. 99.7 FM. You welcome back is the Super Morning Show on Joy, and we're having a very interesting conversation with Dr. Abu Sakara Foster. We want to avoid food insecurity, which is a clear and present danger the way things are going today. So, more in just a moment. First, a couple of quick birthday wishes. This one is to Peter Papa Ahin Gansa. Uh, you are the tech geek in the ho- in your home, and your whole family wishes you a happy birthday today. They want you to know they love and appreciate you so much. And it's apparently, some Nintendo Switch will be going on uh, tonight. Also, it happens to be the birthday of Nana Akumia's wife, uh, Inu Akumia. And uh, Nana wants to send her felicitations and love uh, on this special day. So, happy birthday, Inu Akumia. All right. Um, so, uh, in a moment, uh, we get back to our conversations. But don't forget that having your baby try out different tastes and flavors is not just about giving them a change of taste. It actually helps them develop their palate. It prepares them better to accept varieties of adult food as they grow. So, go ahead and try any of Cerelac's six variants. There's wheat, maize, rice, biscuit tea, fruit pieces, and millet. Remember, each bowl of Cerelac contains goodness that helps your child's normal growth and development. Cerelac, it's all good. Now, did you know that uh, your tax liability can be cushioned by applying for tax reliefs? Well, a tax relief is an allowance given to a resident individual to reduce his or her tax burden. And tax reliefs include marriage and responsibility relief, child education relief, disability relief, old age relief, age dependent relative relief, and so on. And to apply to the Commissioner General's Office for Relief, you need to fill a tax relief application form and submit at any of GRA's domestic tax revenue division offices across the country. Okay, Dr. Abu Sakara Foster is our guest. We're talking about the threat of imminent food insecurity. He's already told us quite a lot that uh, Corona was a signal uh, of looming shortages, uh, but it was also an opportunity for Ghana to shore up its uh, I- internal production of food. Uh, we saw the signs all around the world, supply chains were breaking down, um, uh, and now we are at a point where we are even banning the export of certain foods. So clearly, we are inching closer to the feared outcome. Uh, now, uh, he, 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 he has made some suggestions already. Um, let's bring into cultivation more idle land, increase our cultivated area. Currently, about 33,000 hectares of irrigated uh, area exists in Ghana, but we can do a whole lot more. We have been blessed with the positioning of uh, some of our rivers, so we really ought to be able to take advantage of that and invest in the expansion of irrigated area. Um, uh, At the moment, more than half of the country is only uh, used in agriculture for about three uh, to four months per year. Uh, And then that very interesting point that today, uh, well, in fact, in the past, many people were spending about 60% or more of their income on food. So now that prices are doubling, who has 120% of income to spend on anything, Uh, you know, uh, much less just food? And uh, he admonishes that we should get politics out of agriculture. Uh, It's not good enough to pretend things are good when they are not. It's not good enough to pretend to do the bare minimum. Um, We need to be able to address the issues and deal with them head on. Why have we not emphasized those shock-absorbing crops? And uh, we are rather focusing on the problem crops, if you will. Uh, And uh, that interesting personal um, anecdote about his own farming experience where he says if if only there was uh, air cargo from Tamale, 
it will suddenly make things that are not profitable to produce today, it would make them profitable. And, and, and talking about that, mm. uh, that will take us to the next uh, leg of the conversation, <coughs> talking about flowing of many of these. Because mm. you've made the point that if there were air cargo, for instance, you would be in a position to cultivate more because once you get in, you, 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 you could fly from Tamale to Accra mm -hmm. or take it, you know, Tamale to, uh, I mean, wherever you're taking it to, directly. Now, how does the unavailability of these impact agriculture, particularly in the north? Well, I think it's a very serious constraint on agriculture in the north because it consigns you to growing the low value crops. Yeah. And when you've made investments in equipment, in land development, and to some extent in some parts of the, the, the localized infrastructure, if you don't have this infrastructure, which is beyond your uh, capacity to do, it's really not uh, an individual entrepreneur's investment, it's a public investment, then it limits what you can do. And therefore, it limits the returns to investment in what you've invested in. And also, you cannot then diversify and have some low-value crops and some high-value crops, which then balance out, you know, the books uh, on the farm. So it is a very limiting constraint. Uh, and I think that if we had that opportunity, uh, if there was that focus that, look, we need to extend the infrastructure, air cargo infrastructure, to Tamale and out of there as a priority. I mean, when was this airport built? It was built, I think, 2017, 2018, thereabouts. Yeah, I think um, in yeah. 2016 or 15, thereabouts, you had the uh, you know, first batch of pilgrims actually yeah. moving the Tamale yeah, exactly. International yeah. Airport, uh, so, Tamale Airport to yes. Saudi Arabia. Yeah. So <laughs> this is one of the longest runways in Africa with LED lights, can fly at night, <laughs> You know, and for how many years our investment has been sitting only with small planes going their domestic flights? When for that additional investment, targeted investment, and invitation of some airlines like maybe Kenya Airways, Ethiopian Airways, we don't have Ghana Airways, but they have flights. Okay, why don't you do a Northwest African route? Addis Tamale, Europe. You do one. And then you do another one, uh, Nairobi, Tamale, Europe. Two flights each. That is four flights a week. Are you with me? Yeah. That will give you the cargo space that we need. Even if you have to give it to them at some concessionary rates, at least it's not sitting down there, not doing anything. You're getting some returns. And also it is activating, yeah. <laughs> are you with me, the pro production that could be going on in that area. Because you can get to... Europe in five hours from Tamale. One hour is already taken off. So you can have crops delivered, harvested and delivered same day. Mm. Come early in the morning, harvest it. You can have the same day harvest brand, fresh, in the European market on fruits and vegetables. You know. So I think there's opportunity. Sometimes you just have to be give a high priority to certain things, you know, not everything is at the same level of priority. And when you're looking at the imbalance in infrastructure development in the north and also throughout the country and where it can have a big impact, these are some of the things that you have to give the highest priority. Okay. Yeah. But for us in Ghana, I think the, the, the point will be we want to ensure that when we cultivate, hmm. we consume a lot more in Ghana. Yes. Let's look at one thing which we decided to do. We said we're planting for food and jobs. Mm -hmm. And so, one, we're planting so we could get more food to feed ourselves. And two, we can get more people getting jobs as a result. And later, some years ago, we talked about how we had started the export of maize to our neighboring countries, also because of this whole planting for food and jobs. Today, we have seen the same products that we talked about earlier becoming even expensive and thus not even able to export it to other countries. How sustainable is the planting for food and jobs? Yeah. 
Well, I'll come to that specifically, but you raised a very important point, which I just want to focus on. Sure. You see, if those same products are now expensive today, if you had a high-value crop which you were using the same equipment to produce, you could crop subsidize them so that you get more volume on the low-value crops and then use the money from the high-value crops to, to, to fund that. And you'll be better off. You'll get a better uh, return to investment on your equipment. Uh, the gestation time from investment to making profit will be shorter, you know, and you will have uh, domestic production or things that are uh, marketed put on the domestic market as well as a combination of things that are exported it's not one or the other you can do a combination that will give you the optimum returns to investment having said that going to the planting for food and jobs and the sustainability it is precisely that you have to go along the value chain so that you get the full returns to investment. If you just produce and you don't add value, are you with me? You're not getting your full returns to investment. Mm -hmm. Now, what if you have the people adding value within the area that you're producing, are you with me? Then they can afford to give you a bit more, which they would have used for transportation for your crop. Okay. Now, if you don't have that and you're just producing and bringing it all the way to a crowd to sell in the market, are you with me? The purchasing power is limited in the market. People, the ordinary people buying it only earn so much. So you cannot keep increasing, <laughs> you know, your cost of producing that thing in terms of what it actually costs you to compensate uh, or to make up for it uh, uh, in, in the marketplace. So at the end of the day, you need to be able to say, look, if we're doing planting for food and jobs, let's follow the price in the market. Let's follow the value chain, are you with me, so that our people remain competitive. And let's not diversify so much that the support that we were given along particular value chains is spread into all other value chains and now we're giving only a little bit everywhere. It's like sprinkling a little bit of salt all over the food. You taste it but not feel it anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I think part of the sustainability of planting for food and jobs has come from its own initial success, a, a, a part of the lack of sustainability in the sense that the initial interventions on seed sector was good, but then the spread to we are in for food and jobs, this for the food and jobs, you, all the slogans came out yes. with the same, not a big amount of money increase and thereby you dissipated the effort. So I think that is, it was a victim of its own initial success to start off with. The other thing of course is the lack of concentration along those limited value chains to the point of getting to the end where you introduce a small scale equipment for harvesting, etc., make life easy along the chain, and then encourage some of these so-called one district, one factory to be in those areas. When you look at the distribution of one district, one factory, how many of those are in those areas of production? Mm. You see, everybody wants to be close to Accra. Why? Because energy is reliable. First of all, it may not be significantly cheaper, but at least it is reliable, you know. So your up and down in terms of production costs are not so much uh, and, and uh, continuity of production, yeah. you know, shutting down, opening, shutting down. That makes life more expensive. So at the end of the day, I think that uh, the sustainability for planting for food and jobs is hampered by its broad diversification into all other programs okay. yeah instead of concentrating on where it started the other issue now is that the limited interventions on subsidies on fertilizer and seed are you with me mm -hmm. has created a problem or has has run into problems because problems? because of the uh, significant increases in fertilizer that yeah. we have now and its access and also we choose to pay the uh, fertilizer producers first or sellers first 
instead of the seed producers. So if you don't have seed, what are you fertilizing? Well, they actually complained recently that they had not been paid. Yeah, everybody's complaining they have not been paid. Of course, this again comes back to what I told you. If you don't concentrate on the few things that you have money for and you spread it everywhere, of course you're going to get so people. So if you spread it like paid. that and you're having these challenges, yeah. it means it becomes unsustainable. Well, that's what I'm telling you, that the inbuilt, the, the success it had initially over, uh, what would I say, excited people, and they thought they could apply that to so many other areas. The question is, where is the budget for it? What, the minister will fight hard to get a budget, but of course, you know, all ministers fight for budget. And there's a limit to how much budget <coughs> you'll get. So you have to tailor your in range of interventions according to the budget that you have. What should have been done differently? No, I, I, I strictly I would say that we should have focused on where we started, carried it full term, you know, four or five years, and gone along the value chain, made sure that all the things that we needed to do were, were done there, small-scale equipment, etc., reducing cost of labor, etc., you know, and then linking that to your one district, one factory, so that there will be procurement right in the zone of production. But again, if you don't incentivize those people to start up there, why will he start up in that area when his startup costs are higher, his reliability of electricity is higher, as opposed to starting in, in that in terms Now, talking about startup, why yeah. would he start up at a place where things are... More uh, difficult. More difficult. Yes. There's a suggestion that yeah. maybe we could, instead of limiting it to um, you know, maximum five acres cultivation, to have a lot of farmers, and so we say we have hundreds of thousands of farmers being mm. beneficiaries mm. of planting for food and jobs. Yeah. We could have invested that money into large-scale farmers mm. who are already in the system, mm. or maybe new ones who will be assisted to get into the system, mm. produce more, as we've seen in other jurisdictions, and then feed the states. What's your take on that? Well, <coughs> there was some attempt to do that at the GCAP, which is the Ghana Commercialization Agriculture Project. Uh, again, uh, following up to make sure that you focus on a limited number of farmers and take them through the whole chain, the whole cycle, is important than trying to increase the numbers and then leaving everybody at a pituitary stage of development. I think this is where the politics becomes important mm -hmm. because numbers are important. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're building a system, then you have to make sure that you build it and focus on a few people, get them to a certain stage where they can be on their own and then come in again and then do those things which make their, 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 them, uh, them competitive in the marketplace in terms of policy. <clears throat> now, the ratio of small to commercial scale farmers has always been in favor of small scale farmers. Yes. I mean, we have many more small scale farmers than we have commercial fa scale farmers. And most of the interventions we have have always been targeted more or less to small scale farmers. It's politically the good thing to do. Uh, even the donors, they want to focus on poverty alleviation, not wealth creation, <laughs> you know, yeah. and so on and so forth. And if you go and borrow that money or they give you that money, you have to do some of what they want to, uh, done. But at the end of the day, you can strategically look at positioning yourself and to increase the number of medium to large scale farmers that you have as an anchor of a certain known acreage of production and higher productivity in your agriculture. But you have to invest in it. It's not a matter of just declaring it and leaving it. And then when you go and look at people who want to invest in agriculture, either because it is their passion and they know, even if they know it's not that profitable, they want to do it anyway, mm. <laughs> you know, uh, because they like doing it. Or they found a way uh, where they can avoid certain things to try and make ends meet. Now, when you begin assessing who are the rich people in Ghana? Are they in agriculture? Not a lot. I haven't so, seen when you have a country where rich people are not in the agriculture business, you have a problem. 
it means that they have already worked out the entire financing system for agriculture and decided this is not where I will get returns to my money. I must put it somewhere else. I think last year or something, uh, our good one of our famous politicians made a point about people who put their money in agriculture. And uh, I was at a conference in Kumasi and the guys came down like a ton of bricks. Why should he say this? He's calling us stupid, etc., etc., etc. And I, I was speaking, I said, like, guys, calm down. You and I know what happens there. He hasn't said anything. Maybe the way he said it, he's, uh, <laughs> he's hurt you. But the long and short of it is that if you don't have a national support system that is designed to make your own people competitive in the market space from the cost of financing, uh, the, how you finance equipment, uh, to the cost of fuel, energy in the system, uh, how the access markets, and then your trade policy. If these things are not well balanced, synchronized to make them competitive in the marketplace, and you leave it just to the private sector for them to find their level, it will never balance out. That is the truth of the matter. Great. So, in, in, in wrapping up, then, this morning, we're joined by Dr. Abu Sakara Foster, who is uh, chairman of SACFOS Group and also the founder of the National Interest Movement. Mm -hmm. For many of us, what we are concerned about is how do we ensure that we have food in the right quantities mm -hmm. at a rate where, which we can afford? Mm -hmm. How can we ensure yeah. that we have that? I think right now, uh, our strategy should be to ensure that we reduce our cost of production, particularly focusing on energy, and we have to go to renewable energy. Before you talk of increasing the cultivated area, because that is going to be more capital, you have to look at how you reduce the cost of production itself. So I would say that we have to make a deliberate decision that if we are going to increase irrigation, more of it will be under renewable energy. Okay. And that will be a sunken capital cost as a public good. The entrepreneur can use it and pay for the cost of usage, but we will not demand that capital from him in the first place because he already has so many other things to worry about. Yeah. So that's number one. Then the next big step that we need to take is bringing this idle land, which is lying half the year, not under production, into production, so that we can shore up what we have already produced by adding more to it. Uh, if we try to increase production within the rainy season only, with cultivated area fluctuating, you are, you're doing some interventions, but in terms of total added area. It doesn't increase by very much. It may just be increasing up and down due to total production, etc. So now, if we add this cultivated area from the dry period, we know, because we don't see it now, we know that this is now over and above what we already have. So we've secured it. And already from the excess of what we have secured in storage, this is now coming in. So as we release that, that can go in. That, we don't need rocket science to figure that out, but it must be deliberate and we must exploit our rivers for that. The second thing, the third thing is going to be cost of transportation. I've mentioned cost of energy on the production side for renewable energy, yeah. but also we have to use the waterways. We have from Akusumbo to BP, which is almost 400 and something kilometers. This is 400 and something kilometers of the cheapest form of motorway transport, water transport. Yeah. Most of the countries that we now say they're developed and make so much noise about, they developed using their waterways, not building roads and highways. The roads and highways came later, but the initial, you know, production, productivity increases and competitiveness came from using their motorways. The Rhone, uh, Rhine in Germany, the Rhone in France, uh, Thames in London, yeah. you name it. They were all used. But what have we done with Akosombo and the Volta Lake? Apart from using it for Bost. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? I would have thought that 
the railway would have first gone from Akusumbu, uh, from Tema to Akusumbu, then use the waterway up to Wipe, and then put the remaining railway from Wipe to Burkina. That way, for the same amount of money, <laughs> are you with me, uh, we would have had a complete linkage, part by water, part by rail, and we get the dividends on cheaper transport on water. Up till now, I haven't seen that come through. Of course, we have the uh, railway going through Volta region, but that means we have to take it all the way to, be, uh, to, to Burkina uh, without any advantage of taking advantage of, of our waterway system. Okay. So that bringing the waterway into uh, the transport system to reduce our cost of transportation is also very important. As you notice, all the things I'm saying are making us more competitive in the marketplace. Because by the time we get to the market, then we will have a competitive product which we can increase the volume. If you increase the volume when the price is not competitive, you're only deepening the loss in somebody's pocket. And that is one of the things that we must sit back. We cannot expect the farmers to be the ones who subsidize the cost of living of the city dwellers. Okay, F finally on this, you know, because um, the <laughs> government statistician, mm. Professor Nim, talked mm. about how the challenges we're facing with food inflation mm. for us, it's not because we're not producing more. He believes that, you know, transporting these mm. to uh, the consumption centers or mm. the markets mm. is the problem. Mm. But it's another point. The storage of these, and you've raised another point, continuous cultivation, mechanization of agriculture, mm. something we've talked about all the mm. time mm. but let me get your thought on this the fact that we seem to say that we're producing more but when we harvest we lose them in post harvest losses mm -hmm. and then the cycle continues yes and that's because where you process it is not where it is produced mm. <laughs> are you with me uh, transporting the produce from the farms to the villages, from the villages to the first rural markets, then from the rural markets to the provincial markets, mm. then from the provincial markets to Accra. It is a chain. Yeah. At every step, there's a loss. Are you with me? If you want to reduce the losses, take the production closer to the centers of production. Okay. And you cut it to start right. off with. But for you to do that, there must be the infrastructure there for those uh, factories or whatever to operate and you must now recalculate it's not enough to just say oh those ones out of Accra we we'll give them tax holiday for so many years no we we'll give them a tax holiday for 40 years as long as they're there doing something mm. <laughs> are you with me because okay. being there to do something is not easy if it was they would have been there okay <laughs> Dr. Abusagara but first I, I wanted to end on something Please which do. you touched mechanization mm -hmm. You know, there was an intervention in mechanization centers uh, so that people will run them professionally and provide services to rural areas. It started, I think, during Kufo's time. Uh, I myself have been invested in one, uh, and it ran very well for the first four years or so, doing almost 2,000 farmers, 20, 30 villages, etc. But again, inbuilt costs and obsolescence of equipment mm. and replacement of that equipment. You have farmers who are being ch charging uh, or who are being charged so much per acre. I, if I remember at that time, it was 60 CDs per acre, then it went to 70, then it went to 90. I think this year is about 120 yes. Ghana CDs per acre. Look at the increase in the, in the charge per acre. Plot the increase in diesel prices along that same period. Mm. Big gap. Yeah. Who is to bear that gap? The farmer. Yeah, but if the farmer has limited purchasing power and cannot pay mm. for that increase in cultivation, what it means is that you have reduced planted area because he won't use those services. Goes back to his hole. Yeah. Mm. If you're asking the service provider, the mechanization, to bear that cost. On top of that, replace the equipment. <laughs> Are you with me? Then it becomes unworkable. A lot of these didn't succeed, not because 
it wasn't useful. But because you didn't factor in, are you with me, what it actually really cost to provide that service. And some of these things must be taken as a public good. Okay. If you don't take them as a public good and you don't look at agriculture and absorb a significant part of those costs, are you with me, that a farmer cannot do anything about and find a way of treating those as public good investments, he cannot be competitive with other people who are enjoying mm. those kinds of investments. So irrigation, you go to Israel, nobody pays for putting pipes to their farm. You only pay for the water. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Dr. Wusakara Foster, I mean, it's been nice having you. Yeah. Um, we, we need to have this conversation again. Yes. It's a very important conversation. We're talking about... Uh, how we can ensure that uh, we don't face food shortages and food insecurity in this country. And he's been telling us on uh, uh, what we have to do. It's important that we irrigate more lands. It's important that we ensure that we, you know, we're engaging all year farming. I mean, it Ghana three to four months farming on the average. What happens to the remaining six to eight months? Mm -hmm. What do we do with that? We need to ensure that we actually cultivate still around that time. Our transportation we need to work on it, particularly air cargo transport from the north mm. to other parts of the world mm -hmm. is very, very important. He's talked about water transport also. I mean, he says, oh, look, it would have been easier for us to uh, connect railways to Akosombo, mm -hmm. and then from Akosombo to Buipe, for instance, we use the water transport, mm -hmm. and then from there, we build rail lines from Buipe to Burkina Faso, mm -hmm. and then we are good to go. Mm -hmm. And this is something he believes will go a long way in helping us. This is the Super Morning Show on Joy 99.7 FM. Thank you very much, Dr. Abu You're welcome. Foster it's been a pleasure. For, uh, joining yes. us. Uh, stay with us. There's more after these messages. Thank you. My first thing was sneaking into the fridge to sip on some ideal milk. My first <laughs> telephone was two empty tins of ideal milk connected by a long string. My first taste of freedom was when I had one full tin of ideal to myself in My a fridge. Friend. Friend. Make more beautiful memories with ideal milk as we celebrate our 50th anniversary. You can win a brand new car and other exciting prizes when you text the special code behind each ideal original anniversary label. The more you buy and text, the better your chances. The this advert is FDA approved. Brakweku, can you fix the gas for me? It's leaking. Oh, this one, simple crow. Just carry the stone for floor gimme, make a take put stop. You see say stop? Wow, but what if the stone falls down? Taking risks with your gas cylinder is taking risks with your safety. Get serious 